So in this video, I'm gonna be reflecting back on some of the biggest catches I've had with sea bass over the last few years. Um, unfortunately, in the end of February, I managed to snap a tendon in my, in my ankle. It was the uh, perennial brevis and i i've been wearing some um, spike shoes the first time in about 15 years and just a, a complete accident i just got it jammed down a rock went forward and felt it pop so um, i managed to get the operation at end of march it's about three to six months rehabilitation six months for the full rehabilitation so i thought i'm going to be out for a while and yeah i thought it'd be a perfect time to uh, look back on a few of the the best catches or the biggest catches i've had uh, it's going to be in probably in a few parts i've got 23 fish that i've chosen uh, they're all double figures or a couple of them very close to it Okay, the first catch was the, actually the first double figures I caught on the Samson lures when I, you know, when I was starting out and we had developed the first subsurface lure. We had um, been working on a tweak bait all winter. I'd, I'd been testing it on a lake over in Switzerland and uh, I was pretty sure it was going to do well and I just needed to get down to Portugal to basically test it out. Now the lure was lo looking good for me and uh, I was sure it was going to catch. About four to five weeks before I booked the flight, and as the time got closer, I was checking out the conditions. I can remember on this trip, just watching the wing guru as this massive storm started to develop over the Atlantic. So the last forecast before I went, they were giving something like seven or eight meter waves on the West Coast in the worst part of it, and really, really heavy rains. Now, a good thing about fishing down in the south of Portugal for me is if you have got really big swells, you've always got the south coast you can move over to. So I was thinking, okay, that's going to be good. It's going to be definitely too big for the west coast. So I'll, you know, I'll look at some of the nice south coast spots that I've, that I've fished over the years. Unfortunately, when I got down there, with the amount of rain, the south coast was literally brown. In fact, I've never really seen it like that. It really has to rain a lot. And yeah, it rained so much that the mud was coming down and I think there was big tides at the time. And so that didn't help. Yeah, the whole coastline was totally out of it for fishing for me. It was, it was brown at every spot. And so that left only the west coast. So it was my first real chance to test the tweak bait. And in those days, um, that was the tweak bait. Uh, going back a little bit is pretty ugly I must say but it, it did work well it was working well and yeah it's amazing how we sort of developed it there's been a, probably about five changes over the course of the time um, that was one somewhere I guess in the middle you see these ones were, were quite broad across the back and now the latest is this one is the most recent addition which is um, looks better it's, it's more streamlined and it does work better we're always trying to improve the lures and of course uh, that's the advantage of handmade lures. You can just do little, little changes, little tweaks here and there. So basically when I arrived down in Portugal with this you know, terrible forecast, I thought to get out as soon as I could. The seas were already building and I thought I'd just get out and have a fish. I remember there was uh, frost on the window as well that first morning. It was really cold. I mean, it can get cold in the winter in Portugal but uh, generally warms up a little bit in the day. It was particularly cold. It was really big swells. Um, it's already over two and a half meters and it was building. And I'd say it was the kind of swells that I, I really don't like fishing. They're, they're coming from a long way away and there's some real gaps between the sets and it can really catch you out. So you can be there, you think it's okay. And then all of a sudden, half an hour later, like a, a really massive set comes. And then there'll be a, like a lull in between when it goes quite calm, which is also not ideal. So go from absolutely like crazy rough, big sets, smashing waves to a little bit calm, and then the next set will come. The ideal conditions for me is a little bit more constant. It's not just about the size, it's been more about those constant waves coming in. So it's keeping it at a constant state where um, the fish tend to like that better. And also it is, it's a lot safer and you can pick the spot well, you know, that suits those conditions. Anyway, somehow in that session, I managed to get into a really lovely double figure. And that really, I remember, it really took the pressure off because looking at the conditions, I, I really didn't expect to do well at all. Nice. 
and uh, so yeah i was really pleased to get into a lovely double figure on on the tweak bait on the first you know first session using it it's pretty good because the conditions are hard it's a big swell and it's only going to get bigger so just happy i got one before it gets too big not only have we made a few changes on the tweak bait but we also developed a couple of different versions we developed a slow sink version basically for a slower retrieve can suit different situations depending on how you're fishing some people like to bass fish with a slower retrieve or for some of the pelagics also a slower kind of walk to dog retrieve which i've which i found really effective and we also developed a fasting version, which to be honest, I found really handy in Portugal because some of the trips you go down, you're getting heavy, heavy winds and really big seas. And um, because you're on a trip, you either, you either go out and fish or you, or you don't. So you really need something for the conditions. And sometimes it's been just so windy that I've had the, the lures literally blown out of the water. So developing the fasting version um, has been really has been really helpful, and I've had a lot of um, nice fish on that. So you know the extra weight just holds it in the big seas or in the really heavy winds. Now we're going to be running a few competitions in these videos. So one of the giveaways in this video is a tweak bait in the mackerel design there. And so um, easy to enter. All you've got to do is comment below and make sure you write comp after the comment and you'll go into the draw. Now the draw is going to be at the end of September to give enough people to see the video and enter if they want to. So the next couple of days were blanks, the swells picked up and I was just looking for shelter wherever I could, away from the wind, away from the big seas and, and it was really, really hard. I mean fortunately the colour of the water did stay good. For that size it was amazing because sometimes it can get really big and it will go a really dirty green. But this time even with the heavy wet rains it sort of had a nice blue colour to it and uh, ideal for bass just obviously too big the swells for for the, you know for general fishing so the next fish came a few days later um, the swells were still around three and a half meter was the forecast and i managed to find a nice high tide spot i don't fish that much but um, there was a, a really good channel either side of a rock giving a bit of protection from the main swell um, it was a pretty windy day and unfortunately I had to fish from quite high up. When the seas are really big like that, there's not so many spots where you can be down on the level of the water where I prefer to be. So um, I wanted to fish and obviously when you're, when you're fishing from higher up in spots you wouldn't normally fish, there is always that element of risk. But I tried to be as careful as I could and I decided to put on a really thick leader, uh, the thickest I had. I think I found something in the shed that I would normally do for overseas fishing because I, ha I had a feeling that if I was going to catch anything I would need the leader to, you know, to help not only from the rocks but also to lift the fish out if I got something. So the rocks were pretty steep leading down to the spot and they were pretty sketchy. Yeah, there was a lot of slate, um, a lot of slate sort of breaking away. Um, yeah, in fact, the spot where I actually landed the fish, that the next year had disappeared, it had gone with the erosion, which does happen a lot on the west coast. It does happen quite a lot in Portugal, um, especially in the places where there's um, either a lot of clay or a lot of sand in the rock and it's not really solid rock. Um, these places tend to change quite a lot over the course of a season or over a winter when you've had a lot of rain. You know, paths that were once there can just literally disappear. So I remember casting out to each side to the channel and uh, the wind really helped. I could get out some really good distance with the wind. It would sort of catch the wind up from a height and I could get right into this, um, into the channel on the right I was fishing. Uh, the only problem I remembered that I would need to bring the fish around as best I could to the left if I was going to land it because to the right it was sort of up against the cliffs. I was doing my best to keep the line under control because when you're high up it was strong winds so I was trying to keep a lot of tension on the line or enough tension so I could actually work the lure and I just remember I was sort of working the rod tip with little pulls just sort of tweaking it through the water and all of a sudden this really big bass I saw following swimming after the lure um, for about I think two or three seconds and then the next second I just knew I was on I mean I didn't even see that bass move I saw it following it and then the next minute I just felt the rod tip bang over and I just struck hard 
and, and I was on. Um, it was quite a long battle. It's probably one of the most difficult fishes I've landed off the rocks, purely because of where I was fishing. And I was up high, you know, the conditions, it was rough. It was really difficult uh, to find a spot to land it. So I remember as I got the fish in close, I tried to get it over to the left side, but it got washed to the right side with a wave, and it was sort of up against the rocks. Um, up against the cliffs in that area and I remember thinking it's going to come off at any second. It was just sort of in the backwash there and I just had to try to get it round. managed to use a wave eventually to bring it up on a flat part of the rock in front of me and I literally edged my way down there so I could grab the leader and bring it up. I was there five days, I only managed to hit and land two fish um, but they were both really good fish. First one was 11 pound, second one was 13 pound. I was so happy to have you know come over in those terrible conditions and you know, managed to walk away catching a couple of fish on the new, you know, on the new tweak bait. Um, as I mentioned, um, I fished there the next year. I caught another um, nice fish, not quite a double. This isn't included as one of the fish, but um, the just to say that the yeah, as you can see, the rock out in front had completely gone, completely disappeared. To show how the spots can change so dramatically over the course of a year. It's really rough conditions today. Uh, three meter seas or more. Now the next two bass, three and four, they both came at exactly the same place, exactly the same spot. So it was, it's, it's quite interesting really, because again, there wasn't so many spots to fish. And I'd found another spot with a nice channel and I'd gone there early morning because I was, I was basically limited in where I could fish. And um, I'd gone down there at first light. The seas was really big, so I decided to put on a 90 gram enticer minnow. This morning I'm fishing with the enticer minnow, 90 grams. I didn't have the 70 gram at the time. This is the 70 gram. She's got a really nice profile. I'd have probably used that. But um, having said that, the 90 gram was pretty good for the conditions, really. The waves were breaking into a, a, a deep channel that was there even at low tide. Obviously, with the high tide coming up, it was deeper. And with the big waves, uh, the fish were still able to move up through the channel. Uh, the waves were breaking probably about two, three hundred meters out. So I was casting literally as far as I could, covering as much ground as I could. But yeah, the 90 gram enticer was giving sort of a, a good splash, which you need in those kind of conditions to stand out. Now, the first fish I didn't actually catch at distance. This one literally hit the lure quite close to the edge where, where the waves were breaking against the rocks. Yeah, hooked up to something good there. So it didn't have time to tire it out. So I had a little bit of a tough battle on the inside around the rocks, having to dodge a few waves that were coming in as I had to fish on. Ah, it's coming right close. Good that I got a good leader on. I can feel that leader. And once again, it's well worth using a strong leader when you're fishing in really rough conditions, when the fish can get moved around and you've got bigger waves. It's going to wash him up. You can easily get the, the line scraped against rocks. So I was using a decent leader and yeah, after a, a few minutes, I managed to land that fish up on the rocks. Yeah, I was into another nice double. Okay, it's big seas today. That's a nice bass. It just took this 90 gram enticer I'm using, enticer minnow right on the inside. I'm using this heavy lure because it's such strong seas. And to make a good splash, keep a bit of control of the lure really. So yeah, I'm really pleased with that one. So after that session, I went home for some lunch and because there wasn't really that many spots to fish, it was, I was a little bit limited and some of the places might have been weeded out or, or just too big. I thought I'll go back and have a fish before dark at the same spot. And I can honestly say I didn't expect to catch anything else. I did catch a little bass first, a tiny little schoolie. 
and then right out the back same lures on the 90 gram enticer with a good splash and um yeah i was probably out a good 100 meters and bang i got a nice hit from and i, I knew it was a big bass pretty quick because you can feel with the weight of it yeah so i was pleased to be onto another fish sonic this is literally was the last cast and the bass just hit it and i think it's yeah, I don't Um, you know, just as the sun was going down. So I landed that one as another double. I mean, it's not that I only catch big fish in first light or in the dark. I've had some, you know, fantastic sessions right in the middle of the day. It's, it's really hard to say, but if I, if I could pick a time in general, I would say mornings and evenings obviously would be my first choice, but you just never know. I don't think there's any really hard and fast rules. So although those bass came morning and late evening, the next bass I caught, bass number five, that actually came about 11 o'clock mid-morning. And uh, it always helps when it's overcast. So I remember it was an overcast conditions and you can see from the video footage. And again, I was with the enticer. This time it was the 50 gram enticer. And I was, I was looking to get some distance because the waves were breaking a little bit further out uh, as far as I could cast easily. And you kind of had a ledge on the inside where you can get bass sitting in those type of places. So the waves would be breaking and they can just sort of sit in there using as less energy as possible. You can often see bass or find bass sitting in these sort of spots where they can sit there, use as little energy as possible. They are, they are predators. They do like to ambush other fish as well. It's always good to look for structure. Um, I really enjoy using the enticer minnow in those kind of conditions where it's kind of shallow. You've got a lot of reef around and you don't really need to fish subsurface then. I like to keep it sort of splashing on the top. And if it is in deeper, deeper areas, I can drop it down a little bit under the surface and splash it back up again but i don't tend to take any risk dropping it down too deep at all if it's shallow as as for me it's really not necessary and you don't want to obviously risk losing the lure not only risking the fact that you lose the lure but also the time it takes you know to put on another lure and and rig up again and i was working this entire minute kind of as slow as i could just tapping the rod tip up and just sort of moving the lure from side to side when, when that bass hit. So yeah, so it hit the entire show about 50 meters out. It was a nice top water take. And yeah, it's just a case of negotiating it around the rocks in front um, before I could land it. Yeah, just vary that retrieve a bit, just splash it along the top. Using lots of little taps of that rod tip. That's something it's having a go. Come on, I'm just gonna try and keep it up. Just keep it up on the top. Blimey, it's big. Just keep it on that surface. And get it through these rocks here. Ah, that line just... That's a good size bass. Just don't want to get the line on anything. nice well into the double figures that one um, I was fishing further along and I looked down the coast and I thought it looked really good so I wondered if I could get down and uh, wade out a bit so <laughs> oh dear okay 
Now it's a really good sized bass. I was really pleased with that. Um, now generally when you get a fish that big, they're just sort of rogue fish that you catch one fish that day and you're happy and, and that's it. But you do get those days when there's more fish around. It's quite rare when you get, you know, some really big fish around, but this was one of those days. Some sets piling through now. There's so many rocks out there that, yeah, it's, it's tricky because if you do hook something, you've got to get it around those rocks and hope that the waves don't wash it onto one work out where it's going and that so yeah the conditions were absolutely perfect Every, everything was good um, but still i fished perfect conditions and blanked as you do so you know there's no guarantees getting smashed by the waves here now, all these little channels here are brilliant Uh, it just looks absolutely brilliant behind that rock because there's all the protection for a fish you just sit there and hunt like bass like to so certainly wouldn't be surprised if something whacks that now but i think it must have been about uh, five or ten minutes later along the same kind of ledge i was just bringing the entire sort of long top water there was a big splash big hit and I knew I was onto another really big bass. A big one. I'm just going to hold him in that swell. He's big. They sometimes use up a lot of energy thrashing around, which is okay by me. No, it's just it's a difficult when the wave comes. You keep the tension on because the holes. Um, again, I, I just had to negotiate it around the rocks. Um, it was really close to hitting the line because there was a lot of rocks out of the water. So I kept my rod tip up and I, I just remember doing my best to keep that, that fish on the top of the water, keep it as high as I could and the line away from the rocks. Um, obviously there's always the, the chance it can just come off but the worst thing would be if you broke the line yeah so when i actually landed this fish i saw how big it was it was really big fat um really the biggest bass i'd had in a while i mean i've had bass up to just under 20 pound um, but that was some years back and um, all i've got is i've got some photos of those and uh, good memories so it was really great to get it on video to get this catch there and you know a great fishing session that um just one of those special days really i can't believe it that is a beautiful bass that's bass number two another really big double figure it's just uh i've been blessed on this trip i can't believe it Now the next bass wasn't quite a double figure, it was just under, but it was the, uh, on the same day and it was an end to a brilliant session, another decent sized fish. One of the most important things for me when playing a fish is to keep that tension on the line, unless it's another situation and you have to like let it go out or something like that. Yeah. Good air, oh, I'm on. That one just took it in the same place. <clears throat> right on the edge of that ledge. Flipping out. Lucky I got him over those rocks to start with. But in, in general situations, keep keeping the tension can make a big difference because once that hook's got in the mouth of the bass, depending on where you've hooked it, it can make a hole. And if you leave the tension, that hook will just come straight out. So this was one of those examples. I managed to land the fish and hook literally just dropped out of his mouth once I landed it. And when you're playing a fish, you just don't know how well it's hooked. It could be, you know, hooked really well. You never really know until you get it out. All right, this one's literally hooked just on the lip. And so I've been, I've been really lucky today that they stayed on. It easily could have lost some of these. So yeah, this one straight was right on that ledge. And just as I brought it over the ledge, he hit it again. So yeah, it's been a fantastic day's fishing.